Thank you, Jesus. Give God a hand. Come on. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Thank you, Lord God. We do love you. We do need your presence, God. We do thank you, Lord. Let's just put out our hands like this, and let's pray for Pastor Marco, his wife, their family. Let's pray over our pastors. Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. We just thank you for divine protection, Lord. We thank you that the blood of Jesus is around them. God, that there's no enemy force, whether it be physical, whether it be spiritual, that can touch them, Lord. We thank you that every plan of the enemy, God, any weapon that he forms, it will not prosper. We thank you in Jesus' name, Lord, that their hedge is protected against all words. God, that waves of encouragement are coming their direction. We thank you, God, that waves of strength are coming Pastor Marco and Miss Lisa's direction. We thank you in Jesus' name, their entire family, their house is blessed, their house is anointed, their house is touched. We thank you, God, all their cars are touched, God. We thank you, Jesus, everything they have, Lord, is protected and touched. We bless you, Lord, that divine insight is coming into Pastor Marco's mind like he's never known. We thank you, divine revelation is coming into his heart. Divine capacity, 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 God, more than he's ever known. God, coming into the leaders of this house, we just thank you in Jesus' name for a home that we could call the way, a home that, God, we could be together as brothers and sisters enjoying each other, a home, God, that your spirit can be let loose and be free to roam in this place, a home, Jesus, where you are here with us, among us, commanding us, a home, Lord, where you have been given the main priority of residence. In Jesus' name, thank you for the Wayworld Outreach. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this family. In Jesus' name, everybody pray and said, amen. Come on, give him a hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, I hope you came excited today for the service, in spite of whether you knew I was going to be preaching or not, because the point is, whenever the Word of God is spoken and the Holy Spirit is allowed to be Himself, it is a reason to be excited. Whenever the word of God is spoken and the Holy Spirit is allowed to be himself, it is a moment to be excited. Why? Because anything could happen. Do you get what I just said? Anything. If the Holy Spirit's allowed to be himself and the word God has spoken, anything could happen. Amen? And that's why it's exciting. So, you know, God told me when I was praying for you guys this week, he said, tell them and remind them about the importance of preparing their heart before they get to the word. And, you know, the Bible talks about the different kind of soils. You know, it talks about there's rocky soil and talks about there's thorny soil. And those are people who have the stresses of life that we all go through and things that happen in our life. But they choke out the seed when the word is given. And the importance of preparing your heart ahead of time. God has given you the tools with the Holy Spirit inside of you and the word of God in order to take that plow, that shovel, whatever you want to call it, and go inside your own heart. Before you show up, you turn off everything else. You don't wake up and look at the news first. <laughs> don't wake up before you come to church and watch the news. Don't do that. Don't wake up uh, before you come to church and watch what a politician's speech is. Don't do it. Don't, before you come to church, watch some YouTube videos of some nonsense that's going to distract you and waste your time until you get to the service. Don't do it. Prepare your heart by waking up, saying Jesus' name first. Turn on some worship music. Let the quietness of your home, let the quietness besides your own children's voice and your spouse's voice, besides that, you need to get in a place where you can allow the Lord to begin to pull out the thorns and cut them, begin to pull out the rocks and do it because you want to be soiled today for the seed of God's word to take root. Amen? God leaves it up to us to prepare our own hearts. He does not prepare it for us. And today, this word is a seed. And it's going into your heart. And it's going to produce something massive in many of your lives. This is, we're talking about the Holy Ghost. And just want you to know, this is not the last sermon that we're preaching on the Holy Ghost. Even though it's the last one of the series of the Holy Ghost month. Just know we're not going to ignore the Holy Ghost for the rest of the year. So, <laughs> like, we're going to keep on talking about the Holy Spirit and all that. But this has been an incredible month. So many people have been healed this month. There have been numerous amount of physical healings, deliverances. So many great, amazing memories already happened. I got to know a lot more of you a lot better this month. Had some real great conversations. Um, it's great. My wife and I are feeling more and more integrated into the church. We're feeling like we're becoming more of the family. We appreciate that from you guys for being so warm toward us, so welcoming toward us. Every time I see you, you guys bombard me with hugs, and I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So 
I bless. All right. Let's get into the word today. Does anybody love the word of God? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. As you're turning there, I just want to get you prepared for November. November is a month of abundance. We are calling November the month of experiencing the abundant life. Abundance means overflow. When it says in the Bible that Jesus came, that you might have life and life more abundantly, that word abundance does not just mean overflowing one time. In the Greek, it's a tense, which means it, it was, they were unable to put into the real form of how much abundance God was saying. In other words, it's an unlimited amount of abundance. It means overflow upon overflow upon overflow upon overflow upon overflow. Now, if you might be looking at your life right now, you're not seeing overflow. You might see lack upon lack upon lack upon lack. But Jesus came that you might have overflow upon overflow upon overflow. So all November, the entire month, every Sunday, every Wednesday, Pastor Marco and I were tag teaming. My father will actually be here, Ivan Tate, on the 20th as well. He's going to be here on that Sunday. And we're going to be talking about how to release that overflow abundance through every area of your life. Psalm 23, what does it say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in I shall not be in one, which actually the word is, I shall not be in lack. It means in any area of your life, if you are experiencing lack, it is not God's will. You need to hear that. It doesn't mean, we're not, and, and just so you know ahead of time, November is not going to be the month we're talking about how many cars we have. Just to prepare you. November is not going to be the month we're talking about how many houses we want you to build. No. Like how much bling you got. We're not... that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about biblical prosperity, biblical freedom, biblical abundance. We're going to define it for you. The Bible's going to tell you everything you need to know. It's not going to be from us, but I will say this. It is not God's will that you're in lack financially, emotionally, mentally, in any area of your life. And this is the month where some of these things stop. Some people are under a curse because you have been poor your entire life. This could be financially, this could be emotionally, but especially some of y'all financially, you grew up poor, your mother was poor, you didn't have enough, you have all the memories, you know what it was like, but Jesus is trying to say, he doesn't just want to give you enough for yourself, God gives you enough so that you can give to others and be an answer to other people's problems, not just your own. And God is going to give you a breakthrough. Some of y'all will never ever struggle financially ever again after November happens, ever. It's going to be some good stuff that happens, so please come in November. Man, you received that, didn't you, man? Woohoo! he received it too. Man, you ain't even waiting until November, are you? That's faith right there. Hey, ma'am, stand back up. You just stood up. Stand back up. Stand back up. Because hey, God's giving it to you right now. Put your hands up, ma'am. So what happened was when I said those words, you attached to it in faith, and I literally saw it just happen. He's beginning it in you. Ma'am, you are not just going to exceed whatever you need. God says that he has multiple countries. I see six different countries. You're going to go and be a part of influential leaders. God is going to be giving you a hand, an open hand with resources. The resources are two things. Listen, the resources are financial resources, but secondly, the connections of people. You will connect leaders from the United States to leaders of other nations. You're going to be a networker of leaders. That's going to be amazing. So God bless you, man. There's a lot there, but just touch that. Take, when you, I, I didn't see that coming, but the moment she stepped up and received it, I just saw God go like this. It's like he sent a letter and it just threw it to her and now she's opening it that's what faith does if you don't want to wait you can just go ahead and extend out your faith and say lord i know it's going to happen to me i'm expecting this to happen to me i'm not worried about this happening that's how god likes to move i mean he won't wait for a speaker to have to preach it you understand he's already preached it <laughs> wait, 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 just you don't have to wait for a service. You can go ahead and get in the sermon right now and the holy ghost will speak it to you and you can claim it and you can have it so all right, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Mm. Somebody go, mm. one more time, mm. I like that. All right. <clears throat> Wherever someone turns to the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, the veil is taken away. Do you know that before you got saved, you had a veil over your eyes? You thought you knew what life was all about. 
and then Jesus met you. And you're like, I had no idea what life was all about. Am I right? Okay. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I need somebody to shout on that. I just said the Lord's a spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It's not there might be freedom. There is freedom. He carries freedom. He's the spirit of freedom. He is the Holy Ghost. So all of us who have had the veil removed, those who have now turned to the Lord, can see and now reflect the glory of the Lord himself. And the Lord who is the spirit... So remember what's going on here. We would think that he might have been talking about Jesus, but he's also saying that the Holy Spirit is as much a Lord as Jesus is Lord. Do you see that? Father is the Lord. Jesus is Lord, but the Holy Spirit is as much God and as much Lord as Jesus is. Okay? And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. He makes us more and more like who? He makes us more and more like who? He doesn't make you more and more like Gavin Tate. He doesn't make you more and more like Christian De La Rosa. He doesn't make you more and more like Mike Fandanova. He doesn't make you more and more like Marco Garcia. Are you hearing me? You don't need to be more and more and more like Joyce Meyer, like Catherine Coleman. You need to be more and more like Jesus. He's making you more and more like Jesus. He's making you into the image of his son. You can imagine he's sitting there painting your life. He's going off of a picture he already sees. The only image that he is painting off of is the image of Jesus. So every area of your life that looks more like Jesus is another area of your life that you will get the results that Jesus would get. Please catch what I just said. This is really powerful. This will change your life with prayer, authority in the spirit, everything. Every area of your life you allow and surrender to the Lord, and we're going to talk about that today, that becomes like Jesus, where Jesus takes authority of that area in your life. That area now will produce the results that Jesus himself would get as if he was doing the results himself. <laughs> another piece of Jesus, another piece of Jesus, another piece of Jesus. All of a sudden your feet become the Lord. So what happens? You begin walking as if Jesus himself we're walking in that place. You only walk in the place you're supposed to go. You're not out of timing anymore. You're not in a place that you shouldn't be at the wrong time at the wrong place. You're not going to ever say that about yourself. Why am I always in the situations? Why am I always there? No, 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 no. See, your feet are now like Jesus. He's taken over your walk. Your walk has been given to the Lord. So now you're only going. You're at the right place at the right time when you need to be there. Your hands, he's starting to take over. You see, these hands might have done certain sins in your life. You might not be uh, quite proud of these hands right now. But if these hands become the hands of Jesus himself, the hands of the Father, these hands will lay hands on sick people and they'll get a result like Jesus gets. These hands will lay hands on depressed single mothers and they'll get a result like Jesus gets. These hands will have things pass through their hands because Jesus' hands were unlimited with resources. You got to understand what I'm saying. His hands were unlimited with resources. I'm going to talk about this next month, but let me just give a little prequel. Jesus was not poor. That is a lie that is in the body of Christ that Jesus, when he was on earth, was poor. That is a lie. Any man who carries his own bank around with him is not poor. Judas was the one, remember, had a bank. with Any man who can literally, with five loaves and two fish, feed over 12,000 people, is not poor. <laughs> Any man who can literally, when the centurion comes in and says, you got to pay your taxes, say, I'll get your taxes for you. Hey, go get a hook and get that fish over there. The fish comes, he gives him a coin, give him the money for him, is not poor. All right, once again, we're not in November right now, but just know. You need, some of us need to get a breakthrough in our mind. All right. 
You know that the Holy Ghost, it says, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, there's an issue with this verse. Because if that was the case, literally wherever he is, then everyone would be free as long as he's there. But many of us have been in church services, and we knew the Holy Spirit was there. But some people walked out the same. Some people still walked out depressed, but you saw these people, they were getting a breakthrough, right? Or we've been in worship moments and you were getting everything you wanted, but the person you brought was like, I didn't feel nothing. Huh? Your life was turned upside down. What was going on? Because I thought that if the spirit of the Lord was there, then there's freedom. Well, what happened was in the translation of this verse, when they translated it from Greek into English, this only happens a couple times in the Bible. It, where there's small things like commas that are different or whatever. This one made a huge difference though because the comma was changed and a couple of words were put in the wrong place. So what the scripture actually says is this. Listen to it. Wherever the spirit is Lord, comma, there is freedom. Wherever the spirit is Lord, comma, there is freedom. In other words, the word Lord, listen, write this down. It means mighty owner. Wherever the spirit has been made, the mighty owner, there is freedom. Wherever the Holy Ghost is allowed to become the boss and the owner, there is freedom. It's not just that he's in the building. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But not everybody's becoming free because not everybody has made him the boss. We can be sitting in church with hundreds of us right now and only some of us have made the Holy Spirit our Lord. He's truly the boss of our schedules. He's the boss of our mouths. If he tells us not to open our mouth, we stay quiet. If he tells us to open our mouth, even if we're afraid, we get bold. If he tells us to walk, we walk. If he tells us to sit down, then we sit down. If he tells us to go over and pray for somebody, we don't know what we're going to say, but he's our boss, so we just walk over in faith. There's, there's, there's people, see, there's two kinds of Christians and they're sitting in church every Sunday are the Christians who are coming to church because they love the people at the church. They love the connections with the church. They, they think Christianity is a good thing and church is a great place and they like DG groups and they might even really enjoy the pastor and the way that he is and the swag that he's got and, you know, they might like the worship and everything and they come to church and they're good people. They give and everything. They're great. But then there's Christians who don't come to church because of a pastor or because of a worship or because of something else but because the Holy Spirit is their boss and they're going to obey the word of God and because their life has been given over to the Lord whatever he says it's yes 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 for them it's a different kind of Christian these people don't think twice when God tells them to give because they know they don't own their money anyway these people don't think twice when God tells them to give them a word because they know their mouth wasn't theirs anyway. It belongs to God. These people don't think twice when God says move to this place or this place. They're like, well, the Lord said it. They don't even have to know all the details because they know as long as I got a word, I can walk out on water and things that I used to drown in now are solidifying for me because all I needed was a word from God. I know that he's my boss and he takes care of me when I obey. That's a different kind of person. You see, you don't own your time. Do you think you actually own your time? James 4, 13 through 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it just says that there are people that will say, I'm going to go to this city or this city or I'm going to go to this place or this place or I'm going to stay there for this many years and I'm going to do business here and there. And James looks at him and he says, listen, he says, how do you know what you're going to do? He says, what you should say is if it's God's will, I'll go here or there. I will be in this place or these places. He says, you don't got time. He said, anybody who doesn't speak that way is pretentious and it's evil. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your five-year plan. If you got a five-year plan, God bless you. You should make a plan. The Bible says that a man makes a plan in his heart, but the Lord orders his steps. In other words, God's saying, you go ahead and make the plan, but no, I could change it all and just be okay with that. Make a plan. That's your part. Let me actually do what I need to do through you. That's my part. So in other words, don't be trying to say, I'm going to go do this next year and this is where we're going to be at and all that. Have you asked the Holy Ghost for his permission? When's the last time you said, man, we need three weeks vacation? Did you ask the Holy Ghost if that was all right? 
Well, I thought that any time I could get some rest, it'd be God's will. Yeah, but he might, when you go on vacation, have a setup of some people that he wants you to meet, and you might not be in the right country at the right time, and maybe he already had a vacation that was planned for you, and a place that he wanted you to be, and a situation he wanted you to be in. If you'll yield to him, you might just have an incredible time more than just an okay time. Like, it'd be way better than you could have ever had. I mean, have you submitted your job to the Lord? Like, your plans for your job, the timing, how long you want to be at church, how long you want to be at work? Like, when's the last time you put up your schedule and said, Lord, does it look like your schedule? He's the boss of your time. You know that your family doesn't belong to you? Just because you birth somebody does not believe to belong that it's yours. To people on earth, that does believe it too. That, that, it belongs to you. You're the father, you're the mother. But to God, this is what he says, Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So let's just think about that. All the land that we see, all the mountains, all the waters, they don't belong to recreational services. They don't belong to this person or this person. They might think they're the owners of the land, but they don't own the land. That's why God could turn it over to you in a moment if he wants to. It could give you anything that's on earth because it belongs to him anyway. Everything in it. And the world, this is what it says, and all of its people belong to him. All of its people include your people and your family. So just because you birthed your child doesn't mean you own your child. It means you're stewarding your child. You're stewarding God's child. So if you feel like you own your child... You'll speak differently to your child than if you feel like you're stewarding your child. When you feel like you own your wife, you'll talk to her however you think you have. However you feel like it, you'll talk to her. If you cut her down, you'll talk to her. If you tell her she's worth nothing, you'll talk to her. Whatever you want to say, your husband, you'll do the same. Because you feel like because he's got that ring on his finger, he belongs to you. Or you feel like because she has that ring on her finger, no, 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 no. This ring is meant to tell everyone else on earth that I'm not available. But it does not put God out of the equation. God owns them before you own them. You see, before she's your wife, she's God's daughter. And if she's God's daughter before she's your wife, then it makes sense that he takes it personally what you say to her. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. The Bible says it like this. In Peter, it says that husbands live in understanding with your wives or else your prayers will be hindered. You ever read that scripture? You know what God's saying? He's saying, I take it personally what you do to her. She's my daughter. In other words, I'll just block all your prayers for a while until you get yourself straight. <laughs> Woo! Every husband, let's go ahead and repent right now. Thank you. The blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. Okay, I'm all good. <laughs> hey, that goes for you wives too. Mmm. Mmm. Some of your tongues, ladies, are as long from here all the way out there. Sometimes you got to pull that tongue on back in. I understand that probably what you're saying about him is probably true, but God didn't give you permission to say it. Mm, let's just move on. Dear Jesus, we're not in a marriage conference right now. <clears throat> Do you think you own your money? Oh, man, I got a whoa there. <laughs> Hot tortilla. Psh, okay. Haggai 2.8. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. He owns all the money. The Bible says he owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. He literally owns everything. But does he need your money? Uh, that wasn't convincing enough. Does God need money in heaven? No. No. But what is he asking for your money for? Because what does he want? He wants your heart. And for many of us, remember the only thing that Jesus had to compare himself to that is strong enough to literally pull you completely away from God. He said you cannot serve both God and money. He said this thing right here, this thing money, is an incredible gift. It's an incredible tool in the hands of a surrendered person. But in the hands of someone who begins to serve it more than they serve me, it will take you away from God. 
He owns all the money. That's why he asks you for yours, not because he needs it, but he doesn't want you to need it anymore. He doesn't want you to need money. That's why he's asking you for your money. Because when your heart is right toward money, God will give you more money than you can handle because he's wanting you to solve other people's problems with money. I'm going to say this. I, 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 I don't know why, man. November just can't come quick enough. But I'm just going to, I got to say one more thing just real quick about this because this is going to be an incredible month for some of y'all. Let me just shock you with a statement real quick and just see how you take it and gulp it all week long and see. You are selfish if you don't want to be a millionaire. Let's just see how people are gulping that right now. Just all the religious spirits everywhere right now. Ooh, I just, I, I'm looking at people's faces. So people are they're looking around, money, he's talking about money. Oh, I just, I love this. I love it. I love it when you get religious about money. But let me ask you a question. If your boss came to you at the end of the week and said, you know what? I hear you're not into money. You're one of those Christian guys and you're not really into money. So that's awesome. I am into money. So I'm going to keep your paycheck. Great. You're happy with that, right? What would you do? Sanctified, holy person. Let me tell you why you're selfish if you don't want to be a millionaire. I come from the mountains in Guatemala where there's 150 children who have been sexually abused, who have been violated through their life. We found many of these children eating grass on the point of starvation. In cornstalk homes where there was no roof, in the middle of mountains with women that had seven or eight of them in a 10 by 10 on dirt. And now these kids are not only healed physically, but they are serving Jesus. They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have meals every single day. Listen, they have their own bed. Do you know that every single child, I think maybe besides one child, had never slept in their own bed? Do you know what gave them a bed? Money. Do you know what put them in a home? Money. Do you know what got them all healed up from all their sicknesses, for all their doctor's visits and all their surgeries? Money. Do you know what builds churches after God puts it on the heart of a man with a vision? Money. Do you know what takes a single woman who doesn't have a car and gets her a car? Not just your prayers. Someone has to buy it with money. It is a selfish thing to just want enough for yourself. Because God has made you to be an answer. Ecclesiastes said, money answers all things. Money is not meant to be a commodity. Money is meant to be an answer. It is a tool of making people's dreams come true. And it is one of the greatest ways for opening up a heart to the gospel. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. So how do we get connected into this flow of the Holy Ghost? He's the mighty owner. He owns everything about us. But how do we get him to own every moment? How about when you leave this church and you're walking out to your car? How do you keep yourself saved? Can I just ask that? How many of y'all have been like, man, I'm about to lose my salvation over this person on the road right now? Right? Does anybody ever cut you off and be like, I'm about to become a heathen for about five minutes. I'll repent later. Ah! Come on, don't act holy with me. Whoever here has thrown that finger of love up to people, the bird of, the bird of great price, you could call it. <laughs> Who here has gone to the restaurant and the food didn't come out for an hour and a half and you're like, what is going on back there? And you started getting unsaved for a little while, right? You were not a Christian. If anybody had a camera on you at that time, you would not want to show your behavior on the screen to all of us right now. But afterwards, you probably repented and were like, I'm good now. How many of y'all have put your old man on life support, but you just put him in the back room? <laughs> right? You, because you can't do that sin, but he can. So you just pull him out in the moments that you need him to do that sin, and then you put him back in, right? right? Anybody, I, I'm guilty of this too, right? We all have these moments where we might just lose our Christianity, right? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've been like, oh, babe, my wife, I got to stay saved. I got to stay saved, you know? certain people in your life right well listen to this literally in order to be a christian to stay saved to stay in a place of surrender you need the holy ghost every moment 
You need him every moment. You need him when you leave this. You need him when you get to your car. You need him when you get on the highway. You need him when you're about to go into your house. You need him when you're about to go to sleep tonight. You need him when you wake up in the morning. You need him when you're about to see your children who are lovely people, but dear God, they make you crazy sometimes. You need him when you're about to go back with your husband or wife right now because they're lovely and thank you, Jesus, but they make you crazy sometimes. Am I saying the truth to anybody? You need the Holy Ghost. So how do we get him involved in every moment of our life? I'm going to give you the secret. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Paul is speaking. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Wait a minute, Gavin. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is about tongues? Oh, yeah. This is about praying in the Holy Ghost. I don't know if you've ever heard a whole sermon on praying in the Holy Ghost, but you're about to get a word today because many people do not know the power that is within you. You thought this was gibberish. You thought this was just blah, 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 blah. You thought this is what crazy people do, but I'm about to show you today from the word of God how you plug into power 24-7 is by That's how you plug into power 24-7. That's how you overcome the temptation to hate that's how you overcome the temptations to fall to the things you've been falling to but many Christians they have been taught this is not a tool but this is just craziness so they walk defeated as Christians so let me just break down a couple things Paul is the man who made this statement Paul was a man who murdered Christians Paul was a man who persecuted the church. But once he got saved out of a radical experience, he also gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do you remember? The man comes and lays his hands on him. Not only is he healed of blindness, but he gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. A couple years later, Paul makes this statement. This is a few years later, down in his ministry. He's making this statement. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of y'all to the Corinthian church. Now, that means two things. One, every one of you individually, he says, I speak in tongues more than each of you. But I also speak in tongues more than all of you combined. There's something in tongues Paul's trying to say. Let me tell you what it is. If a man who was once persecuting the church, after getting baptized in the Holy Ghost, could pen two-thirds of the New Testament, how about a man in many of those, Galatians, or how about Romans when he's being held house arrest, or how much but when he's in a, a Philippians, for instance, when he's inside of a prison cell writing the book, and he's writing statements like this. He has a candle... He's got chains on his wrists and his feet. But as he's walking, writing to this candle, he's writing out, In all these things, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved us. Now, wait a second. Wait a minute. He's got chains on his arms. He's got chains on his feet. He's in prison, but something's going on on the inside of him that he could write down in the midst of his circumstance like he's in a totally another planet. Why? Because when you pray in the Holy Ghost, it lifts you above your present circumstances. It puts you into the view of God himself and you begin to see life from a higher point of view. So he can make statements, I'm more than a conqueror. Whether I have much or I have little, I will be content in all of these things. Woo! He's saying statement, why? Because he's 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 not crazy. He's tapped into something. And you need to tap into this too. What does Jude say? Jude 1, 20 through 21. This is the Bible speaking. It says, but you beloved, build yourselves up on the foundation of your most holy faith. Continually progress. Rise like an edifice, higher and higher. Pray in the Holy Spirit. How do you rise higher and higher? Pray in the Holy Spirit. How do you continue to rise? Pray in the Holy Spirit. How do you make continual progress in your faith and you don't park in Christianity? Pray in the Holy Ghost. Did you see what it just said? You continue to progress. You're not parking where you are as a Christian because you're shakarabrosa. You're praying. You're giving the Holy Spirit access to build you. You're giving Him access to bring you up. You're beginning to pull yourself higher. Pray in the Holy Ghost and keep yourselves in the love of God. How do you keep yourselves in the love of God? When there's crazy people around you. 
I gotta take five minutes real quick and I, I just gotta walk over here because y'all are driving me nuts. That's what you do. And you're like, hey, you wake up that morning on the side of the bed and you're like, dear God, I don't know what's wrong with me. I feel depressed today. Honey, baby, I love you guys. I'll feed you breakfast in just a little bit. But I gotta take, mama's gotta take three minutes and step outside for a second. You just got out of a conversation with your sister and all she did was spill hate on you. And, and even though you've been loving her, all she did was reject you. All she did was a push from you. You hung up the phone and you could get depressed or you could encourage yourself in the Lord. I thank you, Jesus. You got this under control. It's a practical tool. It's a practical tool. The word to rise higher literally means to push the elevator button. It's a picture of an elevator or an escalator. It's pushing the elevator button or the escalator and saying, beam me up, Scotty. I'm down on this level in the midst of my circumstances and they overwhelm me. So I need you to swoop down and take me up above the clouds so I can see all above the craziness, so I can see all above the hysteria in my life. You rise higher and you have a different point of view from up there than you do down here. Oh. Let me tell you a couple of things that speaking in tongues is not, okay? Because some of y'all might have been raised in churches or places where like tongues have ceased. They're never around anymore. They shouldn't be there. Or maybe you've been in experiences where people were speaking in tongues and it scared the bejesus out of you. So let's talk about this. Number one, something that tongues are not. They are not something that crazy Christians do. It is not something that crazy Christians do. I'm proving it to you already. When I was speaking in tongues, did you see my eyes rolling in the back of my head? Did I foam at the mouth and roll around on this stage? Was I manifesting? I can literally stay in my right mind and I can stop when I want to and I can begin when I want to because it's a language. This is what 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says. It says, sometimes I'm going to sing in the spirit. I'm going to speak in the spirit. And sometimes I'll choose to speak in understanding. I'll speak in my understanding. I'll pray in the spirit. And then I'll pray in my understanding. In other words, you can switch it off anytime you want. Sane people, that's not a sane thing. If it's sane, that means you can switch it off anytime you want. But if it was a crazy thing people can do, you couldn't control it. Let's have a number two. It's not a religious experience. We don't just do it because we're in church now and church is where we go, shake. No, it's not a religious experience. It is a national experience. What do you mean? When you got saved, you changed citizenship. You were a citizen. Before you're a citizen of America, you are a citizen of heaven now. Your citizenship has shifted. So when you become a citizen, God goes ahead and gives you the language of your homeland. It's not a religious experience when we pray in the Holy Ghost because we're praying to the original language of the country of our home. <laughs> you got a language now. Let me prove that to you. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I could speak in all the languages of the earth and the languages of angels but have not love. You see, these are languages of angels. These are languages of heaven. There are languages in heaven that we don't know anything about right now that we haven't heard. A language on God's level. Let me tell you something about when you pray in the Holy Ghost. This is uh, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. God talks to us and he says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. So in other words, God loves to come and pray and, and exceed on our behalf and come in and come into our lives. And he loves to do it and meet us where we are. He speaks to you in a way you can understand. Thank God for that. But sometimes he wants you to speak on his level. Our mind cannot comprehend that level because his thoughts are higher than ours and his ways are higher than ours. Our personal physical mind is too limited in order to be able to conversate with God and even hold a conversation on his level. So he extends down to our level, but he gave us this language that is of heaven, which is on his level. He gave us a language to pray in the Holy Spirit, a heavenly language, so that we could now bypass our minds, which are limited, and begin to pray in perfect union on God's frequency, on his level. God is giving you a way to communicate to him on his level. 
That's why you'll never understand it with your mind. Are you kidding me? If we could translate and understand everything we were saying in tongues, I think our minds literally would explode. Because when we begin to pray God's thoughts, there's no way in our right mind we would ever say some of those things in English. It would scare the heck out of us to say some things that God actually wants us to say with our mouths. Do you know how much God is trying to get you just to agree with him? You know how many times, even in your own life, he's just wanting you to say with your own mouth what he already says about you. He's just wanting you to use your own mouth to speak over your own self what he already says about you. And a lot of times we're not capable of doing that because of the pains we've been through, the experiences we've been through, our faith isn't there, whatever the case may be. But he goes ahead and says, I'm going to give you a cheap move to surpass all of your own mind, turn that mind off, and begin to allow God to pray to God. You see, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is doing the praying, but he's using your mouth to mouth the words. Now, if God himself is praying to God himself, God will always get what he prays for. <laughs> Tongues are not gibberish. It's an actual language. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4. Tongues uh, are, are different than when you get saved. For instance, uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a different experience. So the Spirit of God is first with you before you get saved. He's what convicted you to come down to an altar call or whatever. Then after you get saved, he comes in you. And then after you're saved, there's another experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit where he comes upon you. He's first with you, then he's in you, then he comes upon you. When he comes upon you, he comes upon you in full immersion. The word baptism means to be fully immersed. It doesn't mean you just got part of your hand wet or you just put your little toe in there. No, if you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you got immersed with the Holy Ghost full immersion. It's a different experience than when you get saved. That is proven by Acts chapter 8, 14 and 17, Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7, a couple scriptures there where the people, apostles literally came back and said, hey, um, have you guys received the Holy Ghost yet? Because these people had already been saved, they had already been baptized into, in water and baptized in repentance, which was the baptism of John. And they both say, we've never even heard about a Holy Ghost. And they said they had to lay hands on them now that they would now receive the power of the Holy Ghost. Now understand, when, and this is a different message, but when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, that was only supposed to be an intro. That was not the last time you get immersed. The Bible says you are to be immersed daily. It says be daily filled with the Holy Ghost in Ephesians 4. Be filled again, then be filled again, then be filled again. It is a daily part of a Christian's life to get refilled. But that was the intro. And for many of y'all, that was an experience you'll never forget. You were, the Bible says, seized with the Holy Ghost. So there are four types of tongues in the Bible, real quick. One is the sign to the unbeliever. That's Acts chapter 2. Uh, and that's when they were there and the apostles and everybody were in a room. And it said they were all praying in one accord and the Spirit of God came down. Came like a mighty wind, a rushing wind that came in. And it said at that moment when the rushing wind came in, they all began to speak in unknown tongues. That word tongues is not personal prayer languages. That word tongues means they were actually speaking the languages of men that they themselves did not know. How do we know that? Because when they walked out onto the deck out of this house, and I've been there to the upper room in Israel, it literally was a door they would have walked out on and then they're open to the street. It says that people from Phrygia, people from uh, Iconium, people from all over were gathering because they were hearing these people speaking in their own native languages, but knew that they did not know those languages. It was such a miraculous sign that over 3,000 people gathered. And so Peter could just walk out and he preached one of the boldest sermons he'd ever preached and over 3,000 people got saved because of this miraculous sign. My dad has had this happen to him multiple times. And uh, on one occasion specifically, I remember there, there was a couple, there was one where it happened in Russian, but I'm going to tell you about this one that happened in French one time. My dad doesn't know a lick of French, but he was up there and he was preaching and he just started bringing a message in tongues, you know, he's just speaking in tongues. And after the service, this woman came up and she said, um, she said, your French is so beautiful. My dad's like, my what is beautiful? Dude, your French is so beautiful. My French, she said, man, he said, ma'am, I don't know French. 
She goes, no, 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 that's impossible. She says, I am a teacher of French. I am a teacher at a college over here, a university. I teach French on a university level. I teach old French, like actual true common French. And you were speaking everything in perfect French. Not only were you doing that, can you please tell me why the pastor told you all of my business? My dad's like, what? You were literally saying all my business in French. To people like, what was going on? I just talked to the pastor about this. She, he said, ma'am, I promise I've never had a conversation with your pastor about you. What is your name? <laughs> you know, and she's, oh, really? And she, yeah, and she goes, but that's not only that. You actually, after you did that, you began to say scriptures in French, and then you would read those scriptures in English right after you said them in French. She said, I don't know what to tell you. I'm coming back to the Lord. I'm serious about God. I, can you pray for me? It was a sign. I have friends that have gone to Europe, literally backpacking to Europe. And these people, I met them in Chicago, and they literally go out to Europe, and it's a couple, a husband and a wife, and their faith is just crazy. They just believe God's going to help them and do whatever he needs to do. So they literally went out into the woods, like in Europe. It was like, I don't know if it's Switzerland, I forget where it was. But they went out there, and they, they had all these people, like, hippie kind of folk, mountaineer, backpacker kind of folk. They went to hostels all over the place. And basically, they didn't know the languages of these people, but they just walked up to them and began praying in tongues, speaking in tongues. But they communicated with these people for two months. Languages they never trained. There's a sign to the unbeliever. That's one. Number two, this is when you're in a corporate setting. This is 1 Corinthians 12.10. When you're in a corporate setting like this, like a church, and somebody comes up and brings a message in tongues, and then there's somebody who brings an interpretation. That's for a corporate setting. The reason why you'd bring an interpretation is because if you just say tongues to everyone, Paul says a lot of people won't be encouraged because they don't know what you're saying. So somebody needs to come up and they need to bring an interpretation. So now people will be encouraged. That is a gift that people have, the interpretation of tongues. Not every single person has that gift. However, there is a number three types of tongues that's mentioned in the Bible. That's Jude 120. That is your personal prayer language. That's where you build yourself up. Praying for yourself, building yourself up in the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you what that actually means. That means when you pray in your own personal prayer language, which every single person is entitled to, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 38 which says that this promise, which is the Holy Spirit, and he comes out right after being, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened in the book of Acts. He said, Peter said, this promise is for you, for your children, for your husband, for your wife, and for all those who are afar off. All those who are far off means every single person can have the ability to have their own prayer language. And he says, what you're going to do is when you're praying in the Holy Ghost, it says building yourselves up. One of the meanings of this actually means the Holy Spirit prays for you. It's the way to get the Holy Spirit's hands on you. If you think that getting hands laid on by me is something special... Why don't you just go ahead and get the Holy Ghost to lay hands on you? If you think getting hands laid on you by Pastor Marco is special, why don't you know, do you understand that God is inside of you and the way that you give him access to literally lay hands on your spirit and strengthen you in moments of weakness and impart to you his power is when you shake. You allow him to lay hands on you. And the fourth types of tongues that's mentioned in the Bible is tongues for intercession. Romans 8, 26 through 27 talks about times when you don't know what to pray. Have you ever been there? You didn't know what to pray, but there was somebody in your life who really needed prayer. You cared for them a lot, but you're like, oh God, I, I really want to pray a really good prayer right now. I just don't know what to say. Like, Lord, they need help. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is there to help you in this moment. And he says he is the intercessor. The Holy Spirit is the greatest intercessor of all time. Because whatever he prays, once again, Romans 8, 26, 27, and 28 says this. He only prays it in the perfect accordance with God's will. So please imagine this. At the beginning of all of time, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost were there at creation. The Father was there writing the plan for your life. The Bible says before you were even formed in your mother's womb, Psalm 139, he had every single one of the days of your life already written in his book. 
The days of your life that were written in that book were already completed before you were ever formed. That doesn't mean that whatever you end up doing in your life and go to heaven, that's what was in the book. No, it means that he's writing it as if you were going to follow his will. His will in your life. Matter of fact, when you get to heaven, that is what God will compare your story to. He'll compare your story that you wrote to the story that he wrote before you were born. And whatever does not line up with your story that you wrote, he will erase and throw it in the fire. Because his story that he wrote for your life, it is your choice whether you want to walk it or not. But he already did write a story for you. He has a plan for you. He already did before you were born. But at that moment that he made that plan, y'all, the map was being written out, all the points of your life, the Holy Spirit was leaning over the shoulder of the Father. And the Holy Spirit was watching that plan being written for your life. And so he only prays according to the original map that he saw in the beginning. He doesn't pray according to what you're feeling. He prays according to the original map he saw in the beginning. He doesn't pray according to how many times you failed. He prays according to the original map he saw in the beginning. He doesn't pray because you don't think you're worth anything. He prays according to the original map he saw in the beginning. He doesn't pray according to whether you have faith in that moment or not. When you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, you shut your own doubts down. You shut your own mind down. And you allow the Holy Spirit to go ahead and realign your future according to the map that he saw at the very beginning Whew. here are a couple benefits and then we're going to pray for you to get baptized on the Holy Ghost who haven't had it yet and many of you who have a prayer language are about to get another one the Bible doesn't say there'll be a river multiple rivers will flow out of your belly the Bible says multiple some of y'all will have multiple different languages these are heavenly languages. Remember, if you think that anything is gibberish just because you can't understand it, well, then Korean is gibberish. Japanese is gibberish. You don't understand those, but they're languages. These are heavenly languages. Here's a benefit. Number one, Romans 8, 26. It will build you in moments of weakness. When you begin praying in the Holy Ghost, when you feel weak, you know that sin that you keep falling to over and over and over that you hate about yourself over and over? The reason why that's happening is because you haven't allowed the Holy Ghost to let his strength come into your strength. The way that you allow his strength to take over your strength is you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. You got to turn some worship on. You got to get rid of whatever that thing is that's tempting you. Walk away and begin to shikadadabukada. You got to allow the Holy Ghost to begin to build your inner man with strength. Number two, it's how you allow the Holy Spirit to lay hands on you. We talked about that. Number three, it's what you pray when you don't know what to pray. There are a lot of times you have no idea what to pray, but you know that that prayer is going to matter. There are people in your life right now that matter too much to God. They matter to the Lord. God loves them. You don't always know what to pray. Matter of fact, and when you do pray, you probably run out of a lot of words after about five to ten minutes. But you know you, they still need more prayer. They need prayer until they get a breakthrough. So what are you going to do? I would suggest allowing God to take over. Allow God to pray to God. Allow the Holy Spirit in you to control your mouth. Give him reins for your mouth and allow him by faith to begin to pray perfect prayers. Let me, this is the next point. Watch this. Next point is four. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, according to Romans 8, 27, you allow the Holy Spirit to intercede on your behalf, praying God's perfect will. Every time you pray in tongues, you are praying perfect prayers. Every perfect prayer gets a perfect answer Jesus I don't know about y'all but if you want guaranteed answered prayers there's only two ways that happens you either get in the Bible and simply repeat the Bible back to God or you shin da 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 you get in the Holy Ghost and allow God himself to begin to pray through you number five this is beautiful Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, we talked about it. This is how God tunes you back to his frequency. You know, we get off. People come into our path, they offend us. We get out of frequency. 
People come, they, they stress us out. We get out of frequency. We, we get off the channel. If you can imagine the radio channel, we're off frequency. We're not hearing clearly now. We're too weighed down by the things in our lives. When you take a moment to begin praying in the Holy Spirit, God is tuning you back to frequency. You're hearing his voice clear again. It will take the clutter out because you're rising above the clutter. Number six, it enables you to recalibrate God's way of thinking, bringing you back to his timeline. You see, when you're off and you find you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you feel like you're off rhythm with God. Am I where I want you to be, Lord? Am I where you're wanting me? Am I doing something wrong? What's going on? But when you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, what happens is God begins to do things in your mind. Your thinking begins to change. You're rising above, so you're seeing it from his perspective. You're getting back on timeline. You're getting back in sync with God. And lastly, this one's got to be one of my favorites. I use this all the time. Proverbs 20, verse 5. A plan or a motive or wise counsel is in the heart of a man or the woman. Is like a deep water with deep well. But a man of understanding knows how to draw it out. I'm going to read this one more time. Motives, plans, and wise counsel are in the heart of men and women like deep water, like a deep well. But a man of understanding knows how to draw it out. What is he saying? The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of wisdom, and he lives inside of you. He is the greatest counselor of all time. Can somebody say amen? Amen. You could pay thousands of dollars to the greatest counselor, has more degrees than a thermometer, but he'll never, that counsel will never compare to the counselor of the Holy Ghost. He's the greatest counsel. He has counsel for you. He has plans for you. I love counseling. I love using Christian counseling. God uses people, but I'm letting you know you have the greatest counselor on the inside of you. There is plans, motive, and wisdom. Have you ever been in that moment where you didn't have clarity? You didn't know what to choose this college or this college or whether to choose this person or this person, whether to date her or whether not to her or whether to go in on this deal or whether you shouldn't go on in this deal. What about, Gavin, all those in-between moments that they aren't necessarily written in Scripture, but they're the things I need for my life, the moments when I'm confused, the moments where I need some clarity and I, I can't necessarily call up Pastor Marco. I can't necessarily call up this person. You know what you can do? You can go ahead and ring, 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 make a ring to the inside, the great counselor yourself. You know what you do? You begin to shim, boko. Why? Because all the counsel and the wisdom, the answers are right here. They're right there. You just have to know how to get them from here up to here. A man or woman of understanding knows how to draw it out. The word draw means to suck. It means you literally, you siphon it from your spirit into your brain. And then you have answers. Then you know God's will. Then you have clarity. I can't tell you how many times I was about to go into a meeting with pastors. And they were asking me advice for church moves or whatever was going on. And I said, Lord God, you're going to have to help me. They're looking at me for wisdom right now. But I need your wisdom. What's going on? I'm sucking it out. I'm siphoning it. And when you get there, God gives you the wisdom that you need. When you get to the meeting, God tells you the answer you need. Some of you need to just stop driving. You need to pull over your car and you need to turn on some worship and begin to shim. And he'll give you wisdom for your sister. He'll give you wisdom for your brother. He'll give you wisdom for how you need to use with your children. He'll tell you how to talk. He'll tell you when to be quiet. He'll give you the wisdom because all the answers you need are already right here. But a man or woman of understanding knows how to draw them out. Whew. Last scripture, I want you to see this. Genesis 3.24. This is the contemporary Jewish Bible. But the original, the original, original Torah. This is the closest they were able to get. But they are missing one part. I'm going to read you this on the screen. But they're missing one part. And this was one sentence that was taken out way, this was, I don't forget when this was, some, some years back, many, many years back, where there was a part of it that they thought, well, they'll just think it's the same thing. And so somewhere in the translation, they took it out, but I'm going to read it to you. Look at this scripture, Genesis 3, 24. Put that on the screen, please. 
It's really important we see this one. I gave it to you in the back. Okay. So he, this is God, this is after Adam and Eve sinned. He drove the man out and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden. And that is a word right there in Hebrew, which is beautiful, but I will not say it. <laughs> the which is what I'm trying to describe right now. And a flaming sword, which turned in every direction. What is the Krivim? K-R-U-V-I-M. And a flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. So look what happens. Adam and Eve sin. They're kicked out of the garden. And God puts two things in the way of the garden, which the Garden of Eden represents the promise. The Garden of Eden represents our access to God. The Garden of Eden represents everything that is for us. Man lost it when he sinned and was separated for us. So Romans 5 says the second man, Adam, Jesus, had to come and regain what the first man, Adam, lost. So he came and what did Jesus do? He opened back up the way to the garden for us. He opened back up access to God. He opened back all of these things, but two things were placed in front of the garden. Are you ready for these? A sword and that word, which is a flaming tongue. Watch this. A sword and a flaming tongue. Listen closely. The sword represents judgment. Jesus took the sword and put it himself. He sheathed the sword by putting all the judgment on himself that we deserved. But one thing was left for us to take as we walk in the garden. <sighs> A flaming tongue. He took the sword, which is the judgment. But the one thing that was left for us to pick up as we walk into back into the promises, walk into the holiness of God, was you need to go in there with a flaming tongue. Whenever you saw the book of Acts chapter 2 and you see when they got baptized in the Holy Ghost, you always see the little picture of a little flame above their head. That's not what it was. It wasn't a little flame above their head. When it says a flaming tongue or their bodies look, the actual translation means their entire body was wreathed in flame, but they were shaking and moving so much that their bodies looked like tongues. It wasn't a little flame. You ain't, don't ever sing that song again. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it. Nah, man. This is a wreathing flame of an entire life, and you are for God. Close your eyes, please. Man, Spirit of God. If you say, you know what, Gavin? I want my language of my home. I'd like a language. I want my personal prayer language. The Bible guarantees that every person who calls upon the name of the Lord will not only be saved, but that he's a good father who wants to give good gifts. He said, if you ask for a rock, will, will I give you a snake? If you ask for this, will I give you a stone? He says, if you being bad people know how to give your good gifts to your children, how much more would God, the great father, want to give you his Holy Ghost? For you right now, you say, God, Gavin, I, I'm just sitting here and I really want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and power. I want my prayer language. All I'm going to ask for you to do is to stand where you are right now in this beautiful preference. Reverence with God. Stand up right now all over this building. Everybody stay reverent right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't want any, uh, we don't need any altar workers for this altar call right now, just you. If you are standing there in this reverent spirit right now, please come up to the front with me right now. Just come on, don't wait, come up to the front. You don't need to clap, nobody needs to do this right now. Just stay in this reverent spirit. Come on up. No altar workers for this part right now. Come on up, it's all the way extend, extend all the way across this right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, lift your hands. You know what's coming. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, just lift your hands. This is a sign of surrender. This is just telling God we need your help. 
We need your help. Go ahead. Line up right behind them. Go ahead. All the way down here, there's some space over here. Some space over here. Just line up. Come up a little bit closer if you can. We're going to be singing that in just a moment with what he's going. Lift your hands. Close your eyes. Somebody's already getting it right now. Wow, they didn't even wait. They're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit right there. Go ahead and sing. I surrender all. Every hand lifted. Out there, make sure you sing this with us. Stay in an attitude of worship, please. I surrender all. Man, people are getting the Holy Ghost already. I haven't even prayed and people are already breaking out. I surrender all. Come on, come on. God, come on. The language of intimacy. The language of intimacy. Your language from heaven. Come on, lift your hands now. I want you in English to sing these words. I surrender all, especially if you're up here in the front. Come on, sing in your language right now. Come on, we surrender. We surrender. Surrender that. I surrender all. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in this moment right now, God. All to be my She's getting it already right here. I what we're going to do. I'm going to say what the Bible tells me to say. Everybody who's up here at the front, look at me real quick. There's nothing special about me besides I just happen to be the vessel that's used right now in this moment. So all I want you to do is put out your hands toward me. I'm a normal person like you, but I'm just being used for God to have this through me right now. Okay, just for you. I'm just partnering with you. I say in the name of Jesus, what the Bible tells me to say, receive now the Holy Ghost. Receive now the Holy Spirit. Be begin to breathe in. Receive to receive now the Holy Ghost. Receive now the Holy Spirit. Receive now the Holy Spirit. Receive now the Holy Spirit. Receive now the Holy Spirit by the authority of the Word of God. Right there. Now what's starting to happen is now close your eyes. Begin closing your eyes. And I want you right now to allow the seed that has just been imparted to you through our partnership to grow in your mouth. Right now it's going to grow. Some of you will feel it deep down in your belly. You feel it deep down just something starting to grow. Just stay in an attitude of prayer with the Lord right now. This is a beautiful thing with God. Thank you, Jesus. Allow him right now just to build that up inside of you. Pretty soon you're going to feel like you cannot contain it. Allow it to just be built up inside of you right there. That's the Holy Ghost. Be Receive the Holy Spirit of God. This is a beautiful moment between you and God. We're not going to be doing anything crazy, but the Lord is already touching you. Let's allow him to touch you. Allow him to touch you. Now what I need you to do next is the most important step. In just a couple of seconds, I'm going to count to three. And we're going to begin to praise God in English. Not in tongues yet, but in English. And what we're going to do is we're going to begin to open that faucet. Your mouth is the faucet. The water wants to come out. It's going to come from right here, those flows. But you need to unscrew the faucet. The way that you do that is you've got to open your mouth. Do not keep your mouth closed. If you are embarrassed in this time, then you can walk, you get, get a little bit of distance for whoever you care about right now. Because I'm telling you, this is really important. If you keep your mouth closed, it's the only way you won't get this. But if you partner with God, you got to open up your mouth. And we're going to start saying praise phrases. I thank you, Lord. You're awesome, God. You're marvelous, Lord. Here we go. One, two, out loud. Three, loud enough. I thank you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Loud enough for the person beside you to hear. Do not be shy. Thank you, Lord. Come on, right out of here. Thank you. Praise Him. High praises. Worship you, God. Magnificent Father. Wonderful Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're powerful. You're above it all. Tell Him how awesome He is. Come on. Thank Him for what He's done in your life. Thank Him for what He's done in your life. Yeah, He's worthy of this right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Awesome God. Marvelous God. Holy Jesus. We worship. We adore you. You're higher than it all. You're greater than it all, Lord Jesus. Come on. Here we go. Now keep on praising him right now. Praise him. 
in three seconds, as you keep praising him, praise him in English, in three seconds, you're going to stop speaking in English, and you're going to begin to pray in tongues. This is all you're going to do. Do not let the sound stop. Allow your mouth to stay open. Here we go. One, two, three. Move your mouth different. Move your mouth different. Ah, la, la, ba, ba, ba. Don't let the sound stop. Don't let it stop. Ah, 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 da, da. There it is. There it is. It's coming out, sir. Let it come out. Come on. Ba, 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 ba. You just got it. You're getting it. You're getting it. You're getting it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Languages with the Lord. Thank you. Whoa, whoa, man. I, wow, wow. Oh, my see, tarabakada. Bron tarabai. Everybody out there praying in your language. Shangarabasi kada. Bron tarabi kada rabosa. Brosa papa. Ba 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 ba. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. Come on. Move that mouth. Don't let it stay silent. Brenda, you got to get this. He needs your faith to partner with him. Okay, one moment, one moment. Everybody stop real quick. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Wow, wow. So like over half of, I'd say almost three quarters of y'all just got this. This is unbelievable. However, however, we're going to take one more dip. We're going to take one more dip. Now, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to give you the opportunity. Hey, I'm doing this because I want everybody to get this. Some of y'all will get this when you get home because you might just be a little too embarrassed for this in this place. Hey, listen, God gave it to me when I was on my bed. So it's okay. However, this is an opportunity. You could dip into this with us. God wants you to have it. He's going to keep pursuing you with this until the time you get it. Just, let, just to let you know. So, but this is a great moment for this to happen. So we're going to give it one more time. We're going to praise God in English after I count to three. Praise phrases again. And then I'll count to three one more time. It's not anything special about the number. It's just to give you a cue. And then at that point, you're going to be starting to now speak. Don't let the noise stop. Begin to speak. You'll have to open your mouth. Some of you are going to sound like this. Ah. Oh, and you might think, man, I sound so dumb right now. Oh, gee. Listen, your brain will try to talk you out of this, but your brain has nothing to do with it. Your brain is being surpassed by your spirit. Remember, your brain is too small for God. So God wants to communicate with your spirit. You need these perfect prayers. You need these for your life. So just allow your mouth to keep flowing. And what's going to happen is you'll begin to form words. Just keep your mouth opening. Here we go. We're going to praise God in English. One two, three. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're worthy. Magnificent Father. Such a good God. Wonderful Jesus. Powerful Lord. Magnificent God. Hallelujah. 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 One. Hallelujah. Two. Three. There you go. Now you're getting it. Whoa. Habasatarabha. Yes, that's beautiful. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, be touched by the fire of God. Perfect prayers. Perfect prayers. Languages of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you. You're touching her, God. Thank you, Lord. Languages of the Lord. Languages of the Lord in Jesus' name. Yes, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Come on, sir. Oh, let that out right there in his belly. Flowing out, flowing up. Him, ba, ba, da, da. There you go. Let that out. There it is. Yes. Bold, 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 bold. Be bold with that noise. Be bold with that noise. Shake on my mind. Boom, ba, da, da, ba, ha, da. Yes, Lord. Come on up. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, he's being touched by God right here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hi, he's giving you a good gift. He loves to give you good gifts. Sham, ba, bo, da, da, ba, ba. He loves to give you good gifts. Come on, everybody. Praise God. Everybody, praise God. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Oh my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Wow. So listen, I would say by looking, almost all of y'all had that. Now there are a few people who say, you know what? And I know exactly where you're at. I got it when I was on my bed. Let me encourage you with this. Don't feel bad about anything that just happened. This is what you need to do. Okay, I'm talking to you now. Go home. When you get in the shower, let it out. I promise. I promise. The Holy Spirit is now with you. Okay? He's already with you. You got saved. He's with you. But he wants to release this in you. He'll take you on your journey. Just open up your mouth and your times with the Lord and you'll get this as well. Can you please praise God? Please praise God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Real quickly, real quickly. Every eye is closed. You guys don't go back to your seats yet, but I want you to close your eyes as well and simply take one step back just real quick. One step back, please. Look where you're stepping. Everybody look where you're stepping. One step back away from here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A little bit further back right here. Just a little bit further back. Okay, altar workers, if you can come up here to the front just real quick. You guys take one step back just real quick. One more, one more. Thank you. 
If you do not know Jesus, eyes are closed right now. This is so important. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm asking you now to say, you know what, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. Giving a little bit of time for the altar workers to come up. I want to know, if you said, you know, if God forbid something would happen and you're not sure that you'd wake up in eternity looking at Jesus, let's go ahead and take care of this right now. If you say, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I don't know him yet, then I need you really quick to raise your hand up in this building. Say, I want peace with God. Come on, I see your hands. I see the hand right there, right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Even up here, just step up to somebody right here if you're already here. Step up to somebody. I want peace with God. Hands up. Hands up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, I need you to come down and be with one of these people right here. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. There's already people up here that are stepping in to get saved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's people here. They're going to be praying. Now, we're all going to pray this prayer together as we allow some more people. There's a couple more people walking up. We're going to allow you to pray these prayers together. Every single one of us is a big family. Let's say this out loud. And you especially who are here in the front, this is a moment you're letting go of your sins. You're allowing Jesus to truly become the Lord of your life like we talked about. He's going to be the boss. And this is a moment you need to forgive yourself. Very important you forgive yourself. So here we go. Everyone together saying this out loud, especially those of you who are up front. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you died on a cross. I believe you raised from the dead for me. I believe you washed my sins away by your blood. I receive you into my life. I receive you now as the Lord of my life. I receive you as my boss. I'm no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty. Look at this precious boy right here. My God, this little boy right here giving his life to Jesus. I'm no longer guilty. Come on, say it. I'm no longer guilty. And I receive your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, everybody, welcome him into the family. Welcome these new members into the family. Welcome into the family of Christ. Come on, come on. Every person, as you go out today, just know that we love you. We thank you for coming to church. Pastor Marco will be back this Wednesday. Pastor Marco will be preaching. This upcoming Sunday, we are beginning the abundant life. The abundant life. Please do not miss this. You need breakthrough in your life? Come on Sunday. We love you so much. Thank you for coming to church again. You're the best. Be safe all week. Stay in the Holy Ghost. Be praying in the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to partner with you in every area of your life. God bless you. God bless you.